you alive. We are a global university. We have a global vision. We recruit students and faculty from around the world. We give them opportunities to learn how to be effective in many cross-cultural settings. And we do this by creating a very diverse environment in NUS. And when people from outside look at the university community, what they see are very rigorously educated individuals who do well in their work. But you know, there are so many universities that are catching up today, and we need to look for a differentiating factor. We must have a strong heart. Um, we must go beyond just mainly uh, academic excellence. Not what the university does and does well, but what the university stands for. And that is the, the passion of the community, students, faculty, staff and alumni, the spirit of the explorer. Somebody who is mentally curious, who has got initiative, resourcefulness, willing to break new ground, which requires boldness, uh, and yet is uh, somebody who is uh, prepared to do something different, to make a contribution. NUS needs to be seen as an organization that is the nurturing ground for people with great passion and the will to go out there and make a difference to their society. And that's what underscores you alive. University that's alive. Where we have members of the NUS community share their passion and their commitment and their contributions in many diverse fields. To share their achievements, to share what they have gone through in their life with the student and the graduate community. Could have been a student. He, he or she could have been or is a teacher, a faculty, could even be an employee, a staff member, or most importantly, an alumni. Individuals who have committed themselves to do very interesting and different things in many varied aspects and dimensions of uh, sports, arts, culture, community service, academic work, and what distinguishes them is a great passion that they bring to their work. The speaker speak for 10 minutes about not so much what he does, but why he does it. What sort of trials and tribulations has he faced? Why does he believe in this? And after that, there will be a question and answer, an interview, a fairly tough interview. Following that, there will be a live question and answer session with an audience comprising about 100 people. You Alive will be in three different dimensions. One, in the auditorium, right, in front of a live audience. While that's going on, it will be carried live via webcam to the student population on campus, right? It'll be, and the students can actually interact live while they're watching it. The third dimension is we're going to be pumping it to linked uh, websites to more than 200 universities, some of the top universities in the world. There's another very important dimension to you alive, and that is it's mainly driven by our alumni. The whole idea is to provoke thought, ignite that latent flame that I believe strongly exists in each one of us. There are many things in life that will catch your eyes, but few will catch your heart. And only when you pursue something that you are passionate about can you achieve greater heights. And to make even more distinctive contributions to the society we live in and to the wider world beyond. You Alive will epitomize that. Passion. Action. Inspiration. He's one of Singapore's leading architects, and he firmly believes in blurring the divide between the urban landscape and the natural environment. He is NUS adjunct professor Tae Keng Sun, 
and he's fired up about finding a better way. We scratch beneath the surface to discover the passion that drives him. The way we learn, the way we think, the way we live. Uh, what gets me fired up is uh, 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 kind of a regret at the way uh, Singapore has, uh, has developed. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, complaining about the, the modernization. What I'm complaining about is that uh, what it has done to the people. The people have become uh, soft, have become weak, have become uncreative, have become, uh, I hate to use the word robotic, but that's just too true. Uh, where, you know, the intellect, the senses, the, 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 the bodily involvement, the kampong living, you know, was what uh, gave us the kind of scope of mind and, and, and spirit and, 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 and gut feel that has been lost, lost in the high-rise uh, urban living. Ladies and gentlemen, Tay Kang Soon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and um, I am so pleased to be here because Viswas said to me, we must enjoy ourselves. Okay, here goes. I am among the first five uh, graduates from the first school of architecture in Singapore, 1964. Uh, the school was then in the Polytechnic, so I'm a Polytechnic graduate. Uh, then I came to this university as a tutor, and now I'm, I'm in the adjunct position. <clears throat> I want to say something about the experience of being in the Poly and being in the university as a start. When I was in the Poly, I was dying to read philosophy, to argue, to debate big issues of the world. Luckily, we had the time. We had a terrible lot of tutors, so we had a lot of time, so we went to the Prince Edward Road Sarabat stall, and we spent most of our time there discussing politics, religion, philosophy, ideas, etc. And that was the education. Architecture was no big deal, we just did it. <clears throat> so today I want to talk about ideas that are important at this moment of history. I think we all know that the world is entering a, a new cycle of crisis. Maybe because of media that we see more crisis. I, I, I wonder. But definitely, we have a financial crisis, you know, 2008. Uh, we have the natural disasters. We have climate-induced crisis, crop failures all over, unseasonable weather, typhoons, typhoon Najis, the whole lot. So, the question which I want to pose to a higher institution of learning is, are we part of the problem or are we part of the solution? And I think this is critical. We need to take a position on this. Uh, so the first part of my talk will really be about ideas. Uh, second part will be about what I do. But I won't have time. Uh, I'm restricted to 10 minutes, so I'll talk about the first part. And maybe in our discussion with Viswas, we'll deal with the other part. OK. So where does one start? if we want to solve the problems of the world. And, and we need to solve the problems of the world. There's no other place to start than to start with ourselves. And I want to make this point, that since the Industrial Revolution, the system, the industrial system necessitated the disconnect between our head, our thinking, our heart, our sentiments and our hands, the things that we do, because we needed to specialize. So thinkers, designers, administrators, 
don't do. They don't use their hands. Those who use their hands don't think, are not allowed to think. It is not necessary. And all have no feelings at all. That is the name of the game. That is the industrial culture. So now we have to, at this late stage of industrialization, when we are moving into the knowledge-based economy or uh, and, uh, a life that, is, that requires us to be much more participant, much more causative, much more involved, much more conscious, not just about our own society, but about every society, not just about our little patch of grass, but about nature. We need to, be, we need to take possession of the important things in life. So we, we, we have now to reconnect. We want to reconnect. Because only then can we gain our own self-respect. Do, self, do we have self-respect? Do we have dignity? That's the question. Just now when we were in the room, I was saying that my students find it very unusual. Why I should feel offended when I drive along the highway and I see this signboard that says, this digital signboard that says, drive carefully for the sake of your loved ones. You have to tell me? I feel insulted that you need to tell me, that you think that, you know, people need to be told to take care of their loved ones. What kind of society have we become? We have become a disconnected society. That is why. And that is why the sense of dignity has eroded. The very interesting phenomenon is that the Maslowian model, the hierarchy of needs, the, uh, from basic needs, we lead, need, lead to higher needs. And that the highest, the highest uh, rungs of the Maslowian model is self-actualization. What the Arab youth have taught us and demonstrated it is that self-actualization can occur and needs to and, and thus occur at every stage of the Maslowian model. It is no longer the industrial ladder that leads from poverty food, security, shelter, etc., and then self-actualization. At every stage, people want to self-actualize. So that is the problem. What are the implications on authoritarian systems? What are the implications on Singapore? What are the implications on education? What should be the relationship between teachers and students? What should be the relationship between teachers and parents? What should be the relationship between parents and their children? These are going to be the critical and the most important issues of our time. Why is it that self-actualization is, is a great demand? Because of the internet. Because at every stage, everywhere, everybody can get to know what everybody else is doing and thinking. One of the Libyans who was interviewed on BBC basically said, in, in answer to the question, what are you fighting for? Of course, he said he was fighting for freedom. But we are fighting for the liberty to live a life like everybody else. Because we are not able to live the life like everybody else. And where does he get the idea of how other people live their lives? From the internet, from the global in the information culture, the other GIC. That is why we all, Egyptians, Singaporeans, Chinese, Indians, everyone, want to reclaim our self-respect and our self and our dignity. Why? Because we want to have, we want to live a courageous life. 
Why? Because without courage, there is no curiosity. There is no ability to ask the difficult questions. No ability to ask the embarrassing questions. No ability to ask questions, period. Because without curiosity, no questions. Therefore, no creativity. Creativity is a product. It's not a process. Creativity, creativity is a product that arises from the application of vast knowledge with skill and that produces the blossoming, the fruits. The, the fruits are creativity. Creativity is not a process. Creativity cannot be taught. Creativity only comes from curiosity and courage. And then, of course, compassion. Because without compassion, create Creativity produces a crook. So compassion is critical, is very important. And, and compassion also comes from knowledge. And then, of course, collaboration. Without collaboration, you can't do a lot of things. Because now we are living, I'm an architect, but I'm not just an architect. I'm a political thinker. I'm a social thinker. I am an educator. I do many things, which I will try and show you later. I'm not just an architect. No one can be just an engineer. No one can be just an economist today. Everyone has to be more than what you are. This is the challenge of 21st century. And then we can collaborate. And the rage that we feel, we do not want to discuss this in Singapore. There is a rage, the rage against foreign talent. But it's a mistaken rage because it is not against foreigners. It is the cry for self-affirmation. The rage is because there is a feeling that the local is being systemically discriminated against. This is the rage. Think about it. I was asked this question about sharpening one's wits. And I said that the paradox is in order to sharpen your wits, you must be prepared to lose something of yourself. You cannot sharpen a tool if you are not prepared to lose some of the metal. You cannot sharpen a pencil if you're not prepared to lose part of the lead. Losing something is a fundamental requirement to gain something. You must lose some quantity in order to gain a quality. That is something which is antithetical to the kiasu mentality. Because the system that we live in is designed and every day we are told all the time that we must gain, we must gain, we must gain. Nobody discusses about losing. You cannot gain, my argument, you cannot gain if you are not prepared to lose. So for me, I have lost my practice in Singapore. I don't practice in Singapore at all. I have no projects in Singapore. Moreover, I don't want to do any project in Singapore. Okay, all my projects are outside of Singapore. And then I'm happy. I am actualizing myself. That's why I'm happy. So, in, to collaborate, you need new alliances, new friends, new issues and new contexts. This is a discussion between the three of us. Tai Quan Trung, who is the Vietnamese intellectual, Surin Pitsuan, who is the Secretary General of ASEAN, and uh, previ previously the Foreign Minister of Thailand and myself. The discussion which was provoked by Surin was, was this question. How do you, how do we deal with 400, 400 million poor people in Southeast Asia? Because if we did not, then we are going to be in trouble. There's going to be terrorism, there's going to be social unrest, 
There's going to be all kinds of sabotage, etc., etc. Because the poor today are not like the poor of the past. The poor today have a lot more information than they had in the past. They're not going to sit down idly. And moreover, there will be those in the middle class who will champion their cause, not because they really believe in their cause, but because it legitimizes their ideology. Muhammad Atta was a middle class engineering student in Cairo. He flew the plane. That is the, 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 the dimension of the problem. So this question of what do we do with 400 million poor in Southeast Asia must be for Singapore the most important question. Are we dealing with this question in our universities, in our colleges, in our schools? Are we aware at all about poverty in Southeast Asia? I don't think so. So I had to reconceptualize. To answer Surin's question, I, had, I was forced to reconceptualize the rural and the urban as one space and not two spaces. And that is how urbanization came about. Rural urbanization. Only then I think it's possible to address the question of poverty so that we can, we can live better and, and we can work, live, learn, play, farm and heal all together. And that we make it, we offer living in the countryside or living in the cities as viable choice. Right now, it is a no choice situation. If you are poor in the countryside, you just drift to the city and, and, and try and find a, a job to somehow. And that's the reason why in the entire tropical belt around the world, subtropical belt included, all the major cities, Mexico, Calcutta, Bombay, Bangkok, Jakarta, Manila particularly, are all surrounded by a whole ring of slums. And I have been to Manila, I've worked with the slum people. It's absolute degradation. Poverty, crime, degradation of every kind. All the good-hearted people who go to build houses, you know, habitat, humanity, I tell them, every time you improve a house in the slum, you are making it worse. Because the problem is not in the slum. The problem is in the countryside. It is because the countryside has failed. That is why they come to the city. So every time you improve the housing conditions in the city for the poor, more people come to the city. As Lao Tzu said, doing more, you achieve less. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, King Soon. Thanks. I thought you were not going to stop. I thought I was going to have to come up and grab you and make you sit here. Uh, I think, I don't know about you guys, but I think it's refreshing to hear a Singaporean have strong views. The point is not to agree with him. And I don't agree with quite a few of the things that you said, but that starts a conversation. I think we need to have a lot more conversations such as this, and that's one of the reasons why we have this. So it's not about agreeing or disagreeing, it's about talking about these things. And let me start by saying that you are known to be a very angry person. You know, you're known to be an angry person. When you say, taking soon, it spells anger. Okay, and it's pent up, it's been there for a long time, uh, and you have rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Not for the right reasons, or not for the wrong reasons, the fact is you've rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. That has cost you quite a bit of pain, you've had to make some sacrifices in the process. Sharpening, sharpening. Yeah, sharpening, yeah. and his sharpening is very, very sharp, a lot of lead went off, you know. Uh, but the point is, the point is, you've had to pay a price. Several times. I'm, so, I, I don't how do you feel? I don't regret it at all, you yeah. know. <clears throat> what are I, some I, of the things that, that, that you have had to go through because of what you believe in? 
censorship. My letters don't get published. Okay. Uh, One of the things was that you you couldn't practice in Singapore because the company that you, the architectural firm, which was quite successful, your partners didn't want you. Yeah, yeah, they, they closed down the firm and... Uh, Architect Tengera. No, 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 that's my firm. That's your firm. Design Partnership. Design Partnership. was a firm that I started together with two others. And um, I was involved in the uh, uh, protest against the, the, the bombing of uh, the, the dikes by the US Air Force when was in that? Vietnam, 1971. 71. I uh, organized a demonstration in front of the U.S. Embassy and um, we jammed the road. Wow. <laughs> and you're still here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, the secret police call up my partner and say, get rid of him. So they told me to resign. I said, no, I, I have done nothing wrong. So they closed the firm and reorganized um, renamed. Renamed the firm DP Architects which without is, me. Which is today perhaps one of the largest, most successful. Yes. Right. And just taking that alone, I mean, that's a major setback. Professionally, it's no, not. No, no, no. I mean, not at all. Technically, it, it could be a setback. <clears throat> and there have been a few other things that has happened in your life, you know, that, that's forced you, for example, to declare, which, as you did just now, I don't build any, anything in Singapore. I don't want to build anything in Singapore. So my point here is this. I think it's important for us to understand what makes someone like you. You're a product of this country as well. You said just now that what we have lost, what we seem to have systematically lost in the process is this courage, this creativity. But you stand for courage, you stand for creativity, and therefore you, you must be an oddball because the vast majority of Singaporeans are not what you are. How did you become who you are and the rest of us become what we are? <laughs> well, I, I think I had a, a, a great childhood, you know. I mean, the Boy Scouts taught me a lot of things which uh, the schools don't teach you, mm -hmm. right? It taught you how to take risks. Uh, when my mother I was a scout for eight years. Very good. Mm -hmm. That's why you take risks. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> why you ask difficult questions in Parliament. <laughs> yeah. But that aside, uh, I'm obsessed with Singapore. You know, uh, even though I, I don't do anything anymore yeah. here, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I, I'll tell you some of the obsessions. Uh, I'm obsessed with the problem of education. Okay, uh, I think that our children are really suffering. Not because the teachers and the Ministry of Education are wicked, not at all. They are doing their darnest best, you know, yeah. right? But they are pressurized by parents. And the parents are part of the whole system that is uh, wanting their children to do well because that's how you succeed in life. But it's a mistaken idea, you see. Is this, a, is this a global trend or is it something that's afflicting Singapore parents or Singaporeans? Specifically, I mean, th for example, you said, I mean, earlier on you shared that uh, privately, you said that you do some work in, in Thailand, uh, Kampong uh, Tamasek in Johor, which I'd like yeah. you to share a little bit about in a while. Yeah. Uh, your experience meeting the children from some of the poorest villages and families in yes. Thailand mm. has been that they are the most creative, most innovative, happiest. Uh, yeah, so I like to, are, are you I, making that yes, comparison? Yes, yes, yes. I like to talk about it. That was a revelation to me, yeah. okay? The children taught me, the Thai children taught me a lot. All right, I, I have to tell you this story. I work with Michai Virabaida in uh, developing a secondary school in Lam Plymouth, which is 350 kilometers northeast of Bangkok. Yeah. It is in the Buriram province, which is the poorest province of Thailand. Why? Because it's very dry. <clears throat> and the children, he started a, second, a primary school and the children are brought to the primary school uh, by luck of the draw, not because they are particularly smart. So they are the average kids. They have never taken an exam in their life. The Ministry of Education was very upset. Mm. 
because the school does not believe in exams. Mm. Okay? And uh, insisted on giving the equivalent of, of our primary six kids exam. And this is the first exam they took, and they scored in the top 10% of Thailand. Okay? So, how did they do it? Amazing. I looked at the timetable. One week, arithmetic. Next week, history. Next week, geography. I asked the kids, why you do like that? Mm. And by the way, the kids speak good English. Okay? Better than Singapore kids, I'm sure. Not, not that good, but... Uh, <laughs> but grammatically, probably better. No, they, they can communicate. Mm. They answered in a very smiling, sing-song way, you know. When we learn a song, we learn the whole song. We don't learn stanzas. We don't learn bits and pieces of the song. We learn the whole song. So when they learn arithmetic, they learn the whole thing. Okay? So I asked the teachers, how did they do it? They say, we don't teach them from the book. We send them to the market. We give them $10 or how many baht each. You prepare the menu, number of calories, and the price of the food. That's how they learn arithmetic. Incredible. All right? And... Um, but why were they, why do you say they were more creative? Could you give us an illustration of that? Because they, uh, they, were, particip they were participant in designing their educational system. By the way, the, in the secondary school, they sit on the school board to appoint the teachers. <laughs> they, this, they, and they interview the teachers. We have the president of NUS here. Can we follow that in NUS? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, some of the other things they did. But Shep, tell us a little bit about why... We have, we have a few minutes before I throw it open to the floor. Question. You created this, this uh, camp called Kampong Tamasek, Kampong Tamasek yeah. in Johor, right? Yes. Why did you create it? Why did you feel the need to create something like that? Who is it meant for and what do you hope to achieve? Okay, it came about because uh, in a conversation, uh, my kids are all grown up, I mean, they are, so, so it doesn't really affect me. Uh, but the, 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 the parents that we, we, you know, in an informal meeting, they were complaining about their, their kids, you know, spending, it's very difficult for them to wean them away from the TV, wean them away from the internet, wean them away from shopping. They only want to go shopping when they have any free time. Mm -hmm. And they are stressed out in their work. And they don't know anything about nature. E, mosquito, E, ants. You know? <laughs> they cannot take any of these things, right? Except for some of our NS boys who go into the jungle, you know, they have to rough it out. But the majority of kids really have an antipathy towards nature. No direct experience. So the, 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 the concept then naturally came about. Then why don't we start, start a school? Why don't we start a... a a, a kind of experimental school. Then, of course, you know, no way we could buy the land in Singapore. None of us can afford that. And it's just too difficult. So, a friend donated 10 acres of land in Johor. So, we are building it now. Okay? And we're going to have a meeting uh, uh, in a couple of weeks' time where we're going to discuss using the model of the Teton School in Yellowstone National Park in America. Mm -hmm. They run a science program, right, in the in situ, in the in the in the in the in the in the national park, right? Where students from all the different schools and teachers and all that can can avail themselves of this this special school. So what do you hope to achieve? Yeah. What do you hope that <clears throat> how young are these kids? Oh they can range from you know toddlers right up to you know, teachers, adults, okay. right? So we've designed it so that we can, we can cater for a large range of and different programs, you know? So that, that is the plan. And uh, some of the Ministry of Education curriculum planning people came to, the, to, to, the, to Kampung Tomasek and we have a discussion. So now we are working with our ministry. How, how we can reinforce the schools here by offering uh, hands-on bodily experience, experiential learning of nature and, you know, environmental technology and so on and so forth. So this is part of the program. Yeah. A final question for, before leading out from this. You clearly have believed 
in this cause. That we need, whether it's in the realm of education, architecture, I mean, it's all meshed in, right, yes. for you. Yes. It, it's a belief system that right. we need to be true you have to, to live ourselves. It. You have to live it. We need yeah. to live it. We need to be true to ourselves. We need yeah. to be authentic, no. right? Uh, and you need courage, curiosity for that. Now, when did you start believing in this? At what age, can you recall, you start, started believing in it? And I ask you again, despite all the odds that you faced, what has kept you going? And, and this, is a, this is something I'm personally curious to find out because a lot of people would have actually folded their bags and left midstream. It's actualizing. Yeah, but that's very conceptual. No, no I mean, it's not conceptual. It, you so actually you feel bloody shocked about it. Bloody shock about it. Yeah. Okay. You know, that you know you, you can get involved and think through it, you know, and, and you know, get the energy and the momentum, right? And and so what if you hit 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 a wall? You know? You just go on. You know, every problem that you face multiplies ten thousand solutions. You know? Too bad if the solution is not here. Yeah. But I have never stopped thinking about, about Singapore, right? This is the, 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 the... A difficult question would be, why am I obsessed with Singapore, damn it? Wow, that's for another discussion. <laughs> I dare not even ask you that question, okay? <laughs> All right. Questions, comments, but no speeches, please. Yes. Val, Val is going to be telling us... Uh, so are there questions from... See. The netizen community on campus, they're tuning in, they're having their own chat. She's the webmaster for that. So Val, uh, you can share with us some of the questions or comments from students. Yeah, I actually have a comment here. Um, this was left on our website from a Mr. Vandana Raghutaman. He's from India and he's an architecture student in his eighth semester. So his is more of a comment. What he said was um, he had visited NUS earlier and realized that the planning in Singapore is so very sensitive to the common man. Every little detail is taken care of and the ender, end user is 100% satisfied. That's a true success to architecture. So I wanted to get um, Mr. Tay's comment to this. Is he hoping to be a Singapore citizen? Oh, really? Maybe. It sounds like an application. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. I would like to okay. Hear. Yeah, I, I mean, this is something that. Uh, never fails to, uh, to, to amaze and astound our foreign friends and visitors, right? But for Singaporeans, I think the perception is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> of course, that, question, that, that remark by our Indian friend is because in, in India, a lot of things don't work. In Singapore, almost everything works. To okay? a fault. Yes. And um, that itself becomes a problem. Expectations, right? No, it's not that. That is, diabolically, that is the process by which the head, your thinking, your feeling, and your doing are disconnected. disconnected. Mm. Somebody else does it for you. Somebody else does the thinking for you. Somebody else does the doing for you. You don't feel a thing. So you have become this, what is, what's the word? Just this, <laughs> just captures it. No, Dis like, disconnected, yeah, disconnected. Like, like, That's I the remember problem. how, how yeah. my mom was absolutely shocked and, and might I add, disgusted when I came back from, my, from OCS, my first weekend home, and I started making the bed, bringing the plates. You know, traditional Indian sons don't do this, you know. You know? And she was disgusted, I mean, more than surprised. Why are you doing these things? You never did it all your life, you know. But it's, it's probably that because there were always people to do it at home. Not, we didn't have any, any house help. It was my mom who did it and traditionally my sisters who did it. I didn't have to do any housework. I didn't have to do any of these things. I had no idea what to do in the kitchen. But slowly, because of that exposure, yeah. I not, not only realized that I know how to do it, but I kind of liked doing it, you know. Um, Some hardship is good for you. Yeah, I got, and after that, I got a lot of hardship, especially after getting married. And then, <laughs> is she tuning in? Okay, all right. Yeah, well, this is the thing, you see, the, the nanny state, I mean, this has been talked about, right? And I took a whole series of photographs, and I wish I could show it. You could, you want to show it? No, not on this PowerPoint. But okay. if you go to East Coast Parkway, you can see 
tremendous evidence. You have uh, footpaths for people to walk with, so you have the footprints. Mm. Then, you know, <laughs> then, the, then there's a sign that says, this is for bicycles, you know. Then, then there's a signboard that says, beware of coconuts. <laughs> Don't walk under the coconut trees. And then there's another signboard with a, with a life ring there that says, if you can't swim, don't swim. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the, 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 unfortunately, there's the erosion, the, the waves they take away some of the beach. So you have the grass, and then there's a drop of about like this, you know, uh -huh. less than a meter <laughs> to the sand, right? And then immediately there's a whole series of signboards. Beware, beware, beware. It's you a know? cliff. Yeah, <laughs> right. So and then there's a, there's a rope, and, you know, painted red. Ah, know? the one, yeah. yeah. Make sure you don't fall down. Well, what's amazing is, I jog on the beach virtually every day in the morning. Yeah. I see these signs, yet I didn't see them. <laughs> Look, you're, it's you're, interesting, you're, right? We, we become so immune to it, that only now that you've mentioned it, it's striking me. But I go past it every day. I actually read the signs, but it never bothered me until now you, you are, you're saying it. Actually, it's, it's true. And one of the problems is when you get used to it. You get used and it becomes normal, right? These signs. But when you, when you put it the way you do... No, the government takes care of us. No. You know, they're very, very concerned. I mean, one of the things I, which I, 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 I learned with great admiration when I was working on the uh, Macpherson uh, with, with, with Matthias Yao, you know, we did a studio with my students. We did a community design project with, uh, in Macpherson, and we talked to the community and everything. It was a fantastic participat participatory design process. And I learned that they have installed a new kind of button for old people to cross the road, you know? You know uh, yeah. So that when you press, you are given another five seconds. Yeah. That amount of consideration. No, it's you know, incredible. Incredible, you know. But this is the thing, you see. On the other hand, they don't trust you at all. Okay? So you drive in from Johor, you, you, next time you... There's a red channel. Ah, uh, yes. Goods to declare, something like that. And a green channel, right? So every time I drive in, the green channel is jammed. You know? All the offices are in the green channel. Mm. Right? So the red channel, nobody. I drive in the red channel. Uh. <laughs> you see? Then the officer stopped me there, you know, say, why are you anything to declare? I say, I have nothing to declare. Why are you here? <laughs> because it's clear, that's like jam. <laughs> you say, don't buy me funny. <laughs> you see, all the officers are in the green channel because they don't yes, trust yes, any yes. of you. You're right? You are not honorable. So, that's, that's meant the way for you it guys. Is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next question, comment. Anyone? Yes. Hi, my name is Eng An from NUS Libraries, and uh, I wonder what you think of Frank Lloyd Wright. What? Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect. Oh, oh he's my hero. <laughs> he's my hero because against all the kind of uh, industrial modernism that was flooding the world at that time, coming from Europe, Frank Lloyd Wright was totally against all of that because he believed in organic architecture. He believed in the Usonian architecture, mm. USA, USO, Usonian. Usonian was his term for. And he, he then invented this whole idea of broad acre city and so on. So, you know, he was a total... Uh, uh, original thinker, and he did not, he, he was not uh, easily, you know, captured by the fashionable ideas. And I must say this about Singapore. That's why the question that was asked to me in the Maverick interview, are there any buildings in Singapore that are worthy of your, you know, your mm, mm. whatever? I said none. Yeah. Because Singapore, all of Singapore architecture is trying to be as westernized as it possibly can be. Because Singapore is a client state of the West. We have absolutely no concern about anything else. We measure our progress by Western standards in every field. This is really 
very sad, you know. And as the most, I would say, as, as the most developed society in Asia, we are really underperforming. And you know, recently there was a very interesting uh, report from Gallup, mm -hmm. Gallup Pulse. Mm -hmm. they, they surveyed 47,000 uh, workers all over the world in order to find out to what extent the workers are emotionally uh, connected to the firm or company that they work in. Interestingly, Singapore and China rank the lowest. 98% of our workers have no emotional bonding with the firm that they work in at all. The highest level of of uh, emotional commitment is Guatemala. So that's a very interesting thing. They are poor, we are rich. So does it mean because we are rich, therefore, we don't care for our bosses? Mm -hmm. no. Something is screwed up here, you know? And also, if we don't care, we have no emotional tie to, our, to the firm, to the organization we work in, how can we contribute to, to its welfare? How can we contribute ideas to its further development? How can we be creative? Are we shortchanging ourselves? And yet we are rich. So to be rich, must it necessarily mean you must not be creative? China may prove us wrong. Yeah. We don't know. This is an interesting question. Don't ask a bureaucratic question, OK? Mr. Tay, my name is Bernard. I'm going to ask that question that you said don't ask. Why are you obsessed with Singapore? <laughs> I, I didn't say don't ask. Okay, I'm asking that. You don't have time. That's <laughs> yeah. what I meant. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it is about reconnecting my thinking, my feeling, and my doing. Okay? It's about being myself. I'm born here. Okay? My... Childhood experiences are all here. I'm the sam salmon who was born in this river. Right? I cannot help but obsessively come back to this river. Even though, in my opinion, the river has become polluted. It's, this is a very interesting question also. I'll give you a neuroscience explanation. <laughs> It's about the left side mm. and the right side of the brain, okay? The right side of the brain is the, the brain that apprehends, that grasps the facts, the information, the feelings, the, the emotions, the reality. And it does it like that, okay? The left side of the brain ponderously tries to understand reality, right? It argues, it reasons, it contradicts, etc., etc. Until and unless a human being reconnects the two, then he's not a full human being. He's a split personality. And he doesn't even know it because the right side of the brain is inchoate. It, is, it does not operate in language, right? It operates in, in uh, emotions, it operates in at a sensory level, okay? The left side of the brain operates in language. Now, consider this. If the language that is processed on the left side of the brain is inadequate, then it cannot recognize because the cognition of the right side of the brain, the cognition needs to be recognized. That means it has to become conscious only through the operations of the left brain, which includes the verbalization. If the verbalization is weak, and I think this is what's happened, I've been teaching for 30 years, verbalization amongst my students is declining sharply. They can only operate in very gross terms. The concepts, the words are very crude. They cannot find very sharp distinctions between word categories. Therefore, they cannot recognize what they already cognize. Therefore, they are 
underperforming. So my obsession with, with Singapore is all these problems. How can we make Singapore the most developed human society in the world? And I'm very disappointed that this is not the agenda. You know, but, but why, why are you so obsessed with making Singapore yet another number one? No, it's not so about being Why do we have to be the best in the world? Why can't we just be good? No. Let's be clear. In, in this area. When, 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 when we, in the popular culture, in the media, talking about, you know, we are the best port in the world, we are the best airport, all this kind of best, we are measuring against others. Sure. I'm saying we need to measure against ourselves. Sure. That is what I mean by being number one. Because you are number one. If you don't believe that you are number one, then you are number something else. You know, this is the, this is the question. Our university is always measuring itself against other universities. Our university should stop that. Our university must become the best university in the whole world. Because it, is, it, it reconnects all of human capacity. The question then we need to measure our performance as a university is, does it reconnect all our faculties? Faculties of mind plus faculties of learning. We cannot separate faculties anymore. What are the interconnections that we need to engender? This is the issue. Do, do you think that you are, uh, King Soon, do you think that you are understood and rejected, or misunderstood and rejected? I think misunderstood. <laughs> but it's my fault. <laughs> of course. So you are not articulating clearly enough. Uh, Is that the problem? That's partly the problem. Partly also I have not, no man, not many channels to, to propagate the no, the, I, the I, I, I'm, yeah. my question was only half in jest. Yeah. My, my point here is, I was listening to you very carefully as you were trying to explain the left and right brain and uh, how you were connecting that to your love for the country. It's a little bit of an effort to make the linkage. You I'll, are, I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. Yeah, I'll yeah, do it again. Scary, you know? But, yeah. but you, you are what, what we call the stream of consciousness person. Your mm. thoughts are allowed to roam free in the wilderness. But there is method in madness, but it takes effort <laughs> to see the method in madness. And most people get tired out. Most people get tired and then they, they tune okay, out. Okay. Besides, I'm going to make it simple for you, all right? Yeah. Again, from neuroscience. Yeah. <laughs> Must we go there again? Yes, yes. Okay. You have to. Now, we all know that uh, we have a body map, right? That means. That's the reason why children suck their toes and suck their fingers because they are constructing their body map from very early age. So we know even when we shut our eyes, when we point to our nose, we will touch the nose. We don't, even without seeing because we have a precise knowledge of our right. body. Okay. Now, think about this. If you wear a tall hat like this and you walk through the door, you will knock, right? But having knocked once, you will next time, you will duck. Why? Because your body map now has included the head. Yeah. Okay. My question is this. My proposition is this. What does it take for your entire... Well, in your own house, you can more or less walk in your house blindfolded because you are familiar with it. Right. Can you walk through your housing estate blindfolded? No. But can you feel, if your housing estate, and by extension, your nation, is part of your body map, then it is a deeply personal, emotional thing. Yeah. How, can you do, how can you achieve that? You can only achieve that when you are emotionally invested in the making of your nation. If your nation is made by somebody else, you are not involved. You are not emotionally involved. Therefore, it is not part of your body map. 
Therefore, it's an artificial construction. It's, a, it's, it's just propaganda. Okay? So the challenge to the PAP is how can you make every Singaporean identify emotionally with Singapore? Once a year at National Day Parade, not good enough. Okay? Yeah. The, the only way is you must increase the participation space. Are you prepared? You're afraid, aren't you? That's the problem. I quite appreciate what Kingston has been saying about education. And uh, Harry, you want to reintegrating say, you know, the Harry self. Harry used to be a permanent secretary <laughs> yeah, and an ambassador. Re reintegrating the self. And uh, ultimately, in the stages of life, as Ericsson says, we need to integrate our life. Right. And the experiences we have had throughout life, studying, learning, working, getting to a retired stage, and carrying on. Uh, the other concept you mentioned is this matter of getting back your memory, getting to recognize, as you said. Mm. And I remember the word remembering. Yeah. To remember is to get our member, members together again and remember. And that takes me to the uh, ideals mentioned in a project undertaken by United, Na United Nations, UNESCO in fact. UNESCO in the mid-80s produced a document and says it's commission's first interest and its very first week evolved a philosophy of learning. And that takes account of all the faculties of humankind. Reasoning, feeling, having a soul, having spiritual dimensions, all the various dimensions that make up the whole personality, so that in the process of learning, you are not getting disintegrated. And it's not learning to do, it's learning to be. And that's the whole title of their project, learning to be and not just to do. And the overemphasis on the school curricula will bring us to the reverse concept of just being able to do in order to achieve something in life. Learning, to do, to do, to live, and not live, to learn. Too much studying may have brought about a certain amount of uh, diminution. Uh, stratifying the natural processes of learning. And I distinguish between studying and learning. We learn as we age. In fact, from the time we were born, we carry on learning. And all learning need not be structured. All learning may, may even be unstructured, as you mentioned your case in Thailand. And that finally brings me to the point of the ladder of learning. I think it was a person called Long Firth who mentioned the ladder of learning. And in our present world of the information age, where we go headlong into this process of acquiring more and more knowledge, very quick information as we get in this globalized uh, techn technical uh, milieu of IT learning, we get information all the time, very quick information, and lots of information. And our children are getting very well informed, far more informed than we were when we were children. But have they got a moment to reflect? Have they got opportunities to <coughs> develop social skills, to interact with people? Are they reflective beings, as well as just people who are getting information? So this ladder, yeah. I just want to mention this, ladder Point of learning, learning no? six okay. points. How many points? Six. No, okay. just six, six, six things that, that yeah. come to this ladder. Information, or data, information, and the third is, is uh, well, information, data, understanding, insight, and wisdom. I think understanding, insight, and wisdom 
are something that has been much neglected because of le lack of reflection. Plenty of information, plenty of data, and I don't know what the third one is. Just a moment, I can't, get, I can't remember everything, but there are six of these. And many people get by with the first three, and they, get, they don't get to the stage of understanding, insight, and wisdom. And all this is the whole process of actualizing personality, integrating personality, actually achieving full integration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. You want to respond to that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that uh, experiential learning is a very important part that is missing. Our, there's too much book learning. There's too much book learning, too much kind of conceptualization. There's not enough uh, risking and experiencing and yeah. you know, doing. And, you and know. talking about experiencing, do you have any slides of any photographs of some of these experiences that you've had with education or some of the projects? Can you can share that with us? Well, maybe, yeah. Okay, what's this? These are the 10 year old children I'm talking about. In Thailand. In Thailand, they run their own radio station. They broadcast every day between four, uh, 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. They tell their stories and they repeat their lessons to other schools. This is empowerment. We all know that the teacher is the best learner. So the 10 year olds are doing. And, and, teaching. and you, were t you told me earlier that they are from very poor families. They are very poor families, yeah. This is another interesting guy. He's an inventor, a good friend of mine. He's a serial inventor. When he was in St. Joseph's School, he failed every year. His father sent him to Canada to a, special, a specialist who diagnosed his particular kind of uh, dyslexia. Oh. And he got a PhD in neurophysiology. And he invents incredible things. This is one of the inventions, right? It's a algae that produces biodiesel and it produces 100 tons of biodiesel per hectare per year compared to oil palm, which is six tons per hectare per year. Oil palm is a waste of time and mm. a devastation on the natural environment. We should use algae. And algae feeds from shit. And it doubles its output when you pump in the CO2 from the power station. That is real creative thinking. Thailand has just tested his system compared to three other systems from America and, uh, and Western Europe. His system is four times better than the best American model. Yet, it is not implemented in Singapore. He also invented a vertical windmill, vertical axis windmill, that captures 80% of the wind when, as compared to the trifoil, that captures only 18% of the wind. Wow. He, he lives in Thailand now? He lives oh. in Singapore. He was in DSO. This oh, DSO, Defense yeah. Council Organization. He resigned. I don't want to give you the details, but he resigned in a very bad mood. Okay, so now he's completely independent. He says, I don't want to have anything to do with them. This is the problem. He's a, this is another guy who's obsessed with Singapore. He's invented a battery which is patented that lasts for seven years without charging. Wow. And he's dyslexic. And so in our school system, he would be rejected completely. This is the incredible thing about Singapore. <laughs> I propose this robotic bus 
We should run a robotic bus system in this university and not those diesel buses. This is the proving ground for a robotic vehicle transport system that we can use, we can manufacture, we can develop the industry in the whole of Asia. Singapore can take the lead. Do we dare? I talked to EDB. Has anybody done it before? Of course not. If it has not been done before, it cannot be done in Singapore. Doesn't it make you mad? <laughs> this has not been done before. I built this aeroplane with, with a German engineer and an Australian engineer. And we test flight, test flown, test flew, flew, flew it in, in Holland. What's unique about it? Very low energy, very high speed, skims the water. This is the transportation over oceans in the future. Imagine, you know, parting right. all the time. I, I have designed a 400-seater to fly across Atlantic and Pacific. Why? Why? Can't do it here. Why? Kampung hmm. Temasek. That's the hall. It's built of bamboo. It's the biggest bamboo structure in the world. When is it going to be ready? It's completed. But when are you going to open it? We've already opened first phase. Okay. Yeah. These are the houses for the parents and the teachers. This is uh, working with the, with the uh, volunteers. Many more volunteers from Polytechnic, University, NTU, you know, teachers. We have a few hundred people working together. Collaboration, because they share the same vision. Yeah. Okay, what, what, I think we, we need to end it here. I just want to show this those one. people are going to have a heart attack Last showing one. me the signs. Right. This is the SMS message sent to me by the Deputy Minister for rural uh, Disadvantaged Rural Regions in Indonesia. As of 7th of December 2009, urbanization has been adopted by Indonesia. Not done in Singapore. And urbanization is rural and urban rural integration. Rural urban integration. Integration. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. We can talk yeah. more about it. No, and and um, I mean, I, I I must say I I don't know about you guys, but I'm I'm totally inspired. As I said, it's not about agreeing with each other. It's about having a conversation. It's about having the courage to push boundaries and not give up. That's a quality that that I've come to admire. I've known you for some time. That's a quality I've come to admire about you. Uh, and I wish a lot more of us would have the courage to just continue with what we believe in. You know, even if we don't achieve what we want to achieve in our lifetime, we need to continue with that. I mean, that's the, that's the strongest message I'm getting here. And, and we are proud to have you as part of our family. I just want to say one last thing, you know, in response to what you've just said. That because I, had, I have, let me quote uh, Woody Allen, I feel he, Woody, Woody, Woody Allen said, I feel so much happier now that I've given up hoping. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, given up hope. Yeah. I, I interpret it as given up hoping. Yeah. And that's how I feel. And because I have no more expectations from my government or my institutions in Singapore, I am very free. I'm incredibly creative. Yeah. The moment you expect something, you, you constrain yourself. Don't. Yeah. Don't expect anything. Then you have a free mind. And well, in line with that, what I suggested earlier, I feel, this is my personal comment, I feel that sometimes when we don't understand what a person is trying to say, we tend to reject it a priori. What we can't understand, what we can't conceive, is convenient for us to reject without putting in the additional effort to try and understand. And I, I suspect that you could have faced that quite a time. But I would like to hope that one day, some of your ideas at least will see the light of day, or at least will somewhere be explored, will be explored. Somewhere. Now, I see some hands. We can't hold, we, can't, we need to stop here. But here's, here's good news. Huh? We're, going to, we're going to go out and uh, grab some food. And then we're going to walk over. Those of you who want to continue the conversation, 
in a small group with King Soon for another half an hour. There's a seminar room. We can go in there for a smaller group, deeper questions. And so please, those of you who have put up your hands, it's not the end of the evening, we can go there. We also don't want to hold back the rest of them who may have you know, things to do. Right? Uh, it leaves me now to invite all of you to join me in not only applauding King Soon, but to say thank you to keeping the, for keeping the flame alive. Thank you. And uh, it's in Singapore convention style. You know, we, we, we are very systematic in the way we do this. We've even, we've even developed the photograph we took just now of us talking live. It's a digital technology right? for you. Yeah, and you look fairer than I. I, I don't know why. Well, why is the lighting the so bad on me? Right? Almost right. the same. So, <laughs> this is from us to you, and with a big thank you. Thank you. Could you hold it up so that they can show it to the rest of the student fraternity? Thank you. And we have one more thing. This is our You Alive tradition, where we will have you say something nice about us. Here. Yeah. I'm obsessed with you. I mean, not with me, <laughs> not with me, but that could be, with the president of That English. could be seriously misunderstood. <laughs> Good thing is he doesn't write like a doctor. He signs like a doctor. Thank you. This is, can you read it for us? Love much, think a lot, best wishes. Great, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for some refreshments. Thanks a lot, King Thank you. Thank you. you.